But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. This lesson was presented at 1008 East Exchange Parkway, Allen, Texas, by Merle Helwig on January 19, 2020. We hope you enjoy Should Christians Bear Arms. Glad to be here this morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, uh, speak this morning. We have a, a beautiful day in which we've uh, gathered, and we want to thank the Lord for, for all of His blessings. In the uh, Declaration of Independence of this country, there's a phrase in that. It says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, uh, you know, we enjoy that phrase. And, and particularly, I think it's uh, abused sometimes as people use it. I think they sometimes mean it to be as, I can do whatever I want to do as long as it pleases me and makes me happy. Well, I don't believe that's exactly what that phrase was meant to intend, you know, there. I believe it had a different uh, intention of that by the writers of the Declaration of Independence. But we do know this, that one of the things that makes man happy is uh, seeking after his own will, doing his own pleasure, and walking in a way that is pleasing unto him, and sometimes with total disregard of, of, every, of everyone else. Today, we live, I believe, in a very troubled world. We see by the newscast of these things that are happening around us, and, and uh, you know, it seems like that we have grown to the point where we're no longer surprised whenever we hear something on the news or some tragic event that takes place. As a matter of fact, it seems like we've gotten to the point where we think of it as, well, that's just, uh, you know, the way the world is today. Well... You know, I don't believe that's the way the world should be. I realize there's a lot of people in the world that are, uh, that do not seek after God or after God's ways and, and therefore it makes problems for everyone else. Last December the 29th on uh, this last year, there was um, an incident that took place and the Tarrant County Sheriff, uh, Bill Weyburn, made this statement. He said, today evil walks among us. He was referring to that shooting that took place in the White Settlement Church of Christ over in uh, uh, here in the Dallas uh, Fort Worth area, where two men or two people were shot before the the gunman was actually shot and and killed. You know, it's hard for us to describe such tragedies as this, and particularly we think about it as this is something that will always happen somewhere else. You know, it's not going to happen. To us, it's not going to be in, in sort of speak, in, in our backyard. But yet, that's exactly where we find it to be, in our backyard, so to speak. And I think also that we've had some thoughts on that matter of thinking that as we listen to this tragedy and the things that have happened in that, it confirms us that it is a troubled world that we live in. And it also brings it down to the reality, though, that even though that maybe it hasn't happened directly to us or we've been directly involved with something, I think the thought has at one time at least passed our minds at least that it could happen. You know, at one time, I think we always thought of it it happening somewhere else. It's always going to be somebody else that's going to be involved with it. It won't be us that will be actually involved in it. But you know, after we listen to the news and we hear it from this part of the country, that part of the country, and everywhere else, but now we're hearing it even in our area of the country, and it's not the first time in Texas that we've had such such, uh, problems as this. And so I think as we would ask the question, if it happens someplace else, could it happen here? And if it does, how is a Christian supposed to respond to something like that? Well, you know, the... um, the way the world probably would look at it would be this, uh, and probably even citing a passage of Scripture on that, where in the Old Testament it said, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so therefore the question comes, do we respond to that with uh, guns for guns, you know, uh, arms for arms, bullets for bullets? Is that how a Christian is to respond to those kind of problems or these kind of of tragedies. The governor of Texas, he made it clear that anyone that had a 
uh, a right to carry or a, a license to carry a firearm legally uh, should do so, and they're at least wise encourage those, I think, to do that, even to carry those arms, even in the religious assembly of the of the churches and such. And there are government, or there are organizations, or there are businesses that um, that uh, specialize in that, writing security for uh, uh, for churches. And you know, the law allows that to happen, and the only stipulation on that is, is that if a congregation specifically would forbid the carry of firearms in their, uh, in their assembly. The governor, he also suggested that all policemen or those that are in uh, law enforcement, that they should wear their uniforms to the assembly of the church and, and bring their arms with them, bring their guns and such as that uh, with them there. Well, in all these things, as it unfolds there, and and then I realize that there are, uh, there are, I guess I would say, religious bodies or churches out there that have secured uh, protection. You know, they've secured secured uh, security to protect their uh, property, to protect their people that are that are there and such. And uh, we know that there are those that have done that because. The white settlement congregation, they had that. They not only had security, but they had armed security. And of course, it was those, one of those men was the one that shot the, um, the shooter there. You know, this is a response, I think, that I would say that would be natural from the world standpoint. I think this is the way the world would think of it, you know, that you, if you're going to carry arms and if you're going to threaten somebody, we're going to carry arms and threaten you too, you know. But the question comes, though, is this is the response for the church? Is this the response for a Christian? Is a Christian to, to bear arms? And I'm not talking about, you know, do we believe that arms or firearms are, are wrong or anything of that? I don't believe they necessarily are wrong any more than any other uh, object could be, because a firearm could take one's life, but so could a knife, could do the same thing, and yet I don't believe that it would be wrong to have a, a knife, and you know, it all comes in pretty handy in prepara- pre- preparing food and such. But the abuse of those arms and such as that is dangerous, and I'm not in favor of, of that. You know, before we go further into this uh, lesson, there's a passage I think that needs to be read that I think should set the, the scene for us as Christians. First of all, I believe that we as Christians are different than the rest of the world. I believe we're to think differently. I believe we're to act differently than the rest of the world. And the response that the world will give to a particular action may not be the response that a Christian should. I'm not saying that the world is always wrong on every response. But all that I'm saying is, is sometimes what the world considers natural and, 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 uh, and, and logical may not be that for a Christian. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, Jesus begins there a Sermon on the Mount. And right at the very beginning of this chapter, this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has these words to say, and I think it sets the scene, I believe, for us as Christians, for our attitude of life and the way we approach life and the things that we deal with in life and how that we are to deal with things in life. This passage is referred to as many as the Beatitudes. Beginning in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those, (coughs) blessed are you when you <clears throat> when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, 
For great is your reward in heaven, for they have persecuted the prophets <coughs> who were before you. This passage that Jesus put at the very beginning of his Sermon on the Mount, you know, I find that those words are the very basis, I would say, for our Christian life, for our Christian conduct. You know, I don't find in any part, any part of this passage that I read that describes a worldly person. And I'm talking about a, a non-believer, one that does not believe in God. I don't see anything in that. But I do see in that passage those things that describe a faithful Christian. Those that would describe a disciple of Christ that's serving and trying to do the Lord's, uh, the Lord's will. You know, the Apostle Paul, he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17 there, he said, Therefore come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. You and I are to be separate from the rest of the world. I realize we live in this world, but we're to be separate from the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to live like the world. We're to live as a Christian, a follower of God. You know, I believe that uh, we can conclude early on in this lesson that a disciple of Christ is to be and to act differently than the man of the, of the world or the, non, the non-believer. The Christian is to think differently and to reason differently than the man of the world would reason there. <clears throat> you know, we recognize that there's a lot of things in the world that are acceptable and that are approved by the world and would be a natural response for the world and no one would find any problem with that. But that's not always the case with a Christian. We cannot always, just because the world says this or the world acts this way or the world encourages one to do certain things, doesn't mean that it is right for us as a Christian. Here's an interesting little passage over there, a verse over in the Old Testament. Over in the book of Esther, the third chapter and the eighth verse, there's a man by the name of Haman that's speaking, and he's speaking to the king. And uh, one of the things that he says to the king, and first of all, let me say this about Haman, the man that's uh, doing the talking now. He's a man that hates God's people. He despises God's people, and he's talking about the Jews. He doesn't have any love, I guess you would say, whatsoever, and For his part, he would like to see them, I guess you would say, exterminated. You know, in other words, get rid of them all. But anyway, this is what he says whenever he goes before the king, Asher is. He says in verse 8, he says, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other people's. <clears throat> you know, he's describing the children of Israel. He's describing the Jews. And what he says is, he said, this people, and he's referring to the Jews that's scattered and living now among those of the rest of the world. In his kingdom there, and he said, they're different. Their laws are different. You know, I would attest today that there is a people that is different living among the population of the world, that's scattered in this worldly population that is different, that have different laws, and that live by different rules, and that think differently than the rest of the world. And who I'm talking about, you and I as a Christian, we live in this world, but we're not of the world. We live in this world, and we understand things that happen in this world that we're not in favor of, and we're not going to act like the rest of the world is. You know, the Christian's responsibility, first and foremost, is to God. You know, it comes before everything else, and I think it was the apostles that probably answered that and stated it better than anywhere else. Remember in Acts, the fifth chapter and the 29th verse, when they stood there before the council, And the council was threatening them, you know, not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus and all of this and, and, uh, and, you know, trying to make it as as sure as they could for them to understand that they are to stop preaching, stop teaching the gospel of Christ. And this was their response. Peter and the rest of the apostles, they said, 
We ought to obey God rather than men. Today, who do we serve? We serve the living God. He is the one that we give our allegiance to. He's the one that we give our honor to. And we're not serving the world. And I realize we will respect the laws of the land as long as they're not in conflict or against the law of God. We have that responsibility and that obligation. But our first obligation is to serve God. Christ made it very clear whenever He was talking about discipleship. Over in Luke, the 14th chapter and the 26th verse, when Jesus says here, He said, If anyone comes to Me and does not hate his father, mother, wife, children, brother, and sister, yes, in his own life he cannot be My disciple. You know, I would understand that what Jesus is saying here is that He comes before all. God in Christ comes before family, it comes before job, it comes before country, it becomes before everything. And you know, he says there that if not, you cannot be my disciple. You know, we must understand and come to grips with the fact that we are to be different than the world. The reason why we're here instead of in some other religious body today is because of truth, because of right. And one of the things that we worship and the way we worship is because the Bible commands that. And I believe as Christians that we will follow that command. You know, as I mentioned, whenever we're talking about bearing arms and whether we can bear arms against another person. You know, are firearms uh, wrong? Well, I don't think they're necessarily sinful. I don't think they're necessarily evil. I think they can be used in an evil way, I guess, in a sinful way. It can be used to take life. You know, the same way, as I mentioned, you could do that with a knife, but yet, at the same time, it was... uh, the hunter, for example, and with that uh, rifle that he had that put food on the table for families for years and years. You know, I remember as a child going out rabbit hunting, and and uh, you know we didn't ra- you know we didn't kill a rabbit and leave it lay there. We took that rabbit home and we ate that rabbit. You know, I'm not saying that it was something we had to do, you know. I mean, we would have starved without that, but we did that. And, you know, we also find that the preparation of that food was easily prepared or easier to be prepared with a, with a knife, you know. And so I don't believe they're necessarily wrong. However, though, I do believe this, they can be used wrong. You know, the Bible says that Esau, for example, he was a hunter. He was a skillful man. He was a skillful hunter, and because of that, he put food on the table for his, for his family. And you know, that can be used, as I say, in a, in a proper way. However, though, I am opposed to the using of firearms in a way that would be wrong. Against another person, for example, against or uh, no more than it would be wrong for using a, a knife or a machete to take one's life. You know, that would, be, that would be wrong. But let me say this, and I think it would be appropriate to talk just a little bit about fear. Because I think fear is one of the things that uh, is necessary in, in life. And, uh, and let me tell you this, that uh, you say, well, you know, I'm not afraid of anything. Well, if you're not afraid of anything, let me tell you something, you've got a problem. You know what, if you're going to go out and stand in the middle of I-75 and have no fear, you know, you're going to get run over. And fear is something that God gave us. Fear is, a, is that quality of life that God gave us for the pres- preservation of life. But if you have no fear, then you recognize no danger. You know, you don't recognize there's a, there's a problem out there. And so I think we look at fear, it is necessary, but yet I think it's also fear that prompts us to do things that maybe we shouldn't do. 
you know, for example, the preservation of life. I think we a lot of times think that, uh, that the most horrible thing, the worst thing that could ever happen to us would be to die. You know, the worst thing that could happen to us would be for somebody to take our lives, you know, or to be killed. You know, I don't know that that's necessarily true. You know, I'm not saying that we go out and step out in front of an 18-wheeler on 75, you know, just to find out if it's true or not. You know, I don't think it's necessary to put our lives in danger, but I believe there is something worse than death. As a matter of fact, you know, it's the only way that one is going to get to heaven is going to be able, he has to die first. He has to shed this, uh, this earthly body that we all have before we're going to be able to enter into heaven because in heaven there is no flesh, there is no blood in heaven. And right now, what you have and what I have is a flesh and blood body. In other words, that is going to have to be laid aside before we're going to enter into heaven. Over in Matthew, the 10th chapter, in verse 28, listen to what Jesus says here. He says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. You know, what Jesus is telling us there is that death should not be fearful for a Christian. And I'm not saying that, you know, we look at it with no anxiety or anything, because I think there would be a certain amount of anxiety when it comes to death. For one thing, you know, when you travel a road many, many times, you know, you get accustomed to it. When you do something many, many times, you get accustomed to it. You get something that you would say that almost becomes sort of natural to a, to a person. But, you know, one of the things that we've never done once yet. Not any of us have done this yet, and that is die. You know, death is still ahead of each one of us. You know, we may have said, well, I had a brush with death, you know, or I just narrowly escaped death, you know, by some accident that you just about had. But so far... The breath that we breathe has not stopped. The blood that is coursing through our veins has not stopped. We are all alive, and so therefore, when I talk about death, I can say there's something worse than death, but yet I've never experienced that. I've never experienced death. But I do know this for a Christian, one of the things that we have to look forward to is something that's better and what's in this life here. We look forward to that home in heaven. We look forward to what God has prepared for us. And for a Christian, that is something to look forward to. And the Apostle John, when he wrote in the book of Revelation there, he, he described that in, in such good ways, you know, where he said there that there will be no sorrow, there will be no pain, there will be no death. Those are the terms that he described Heaven is. Last night, a brother in Mexico, a preacher, passed away. Brother Ronnie Wade has passed away. Brother Johnny Elmore, preachers that we've known, have died. Loved ones have died. Friends have died. We understand that. But yet, one of the things that we know is, is for the faithful. For the faithful, it's going to be a reward on the other side. But let me say this, for the one that is not prepared, the one that is not a Christian, the one that is not faithful, let me tell you something, it is going to be worse than death. It is going to be worse than living. It's going to be worse than anything you could ever imagine because the Bible describes this as what? That place as a lake of fire. And the Bible also describes that. He said, the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. It's not going to be for a moment. It's not going to be for an instant and it's all over with. It will never be over with. Yes, there is something worse than death. 
But you know what Jesus was saying there? He says, don't worry about the man that is going to be able to take this life. Worry about the one that can take your soul. There's a big difference on that. And you know what? No one can take one's soul unless we surrender it. Because you have the, the right, you have the ability to make a decision. And you decide where you're going. You decide who you are. You decide what you are. And you decide whether you're going to serve God, whether you're going to serve the world, whether you're going to serve Satan, or whether you're going to serve Christ. And you know what? Those that are His, and He's speaking about Jesus there, those that are His, He will protect. You know, He will take care of that person. But you know, taking care of that person doesn't mean that one may not lose a life. You know, then the apostles there in Acts chapter 5, I just read, you know, they stated it so well about where we are. It says, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, obeying God comes first. And you know what? If we lose our lives in our service to God and being faithful to Him, our reward is going to be so much greater. You know, here's some things that I think it's hard for me to deal with. And it's hard for me to respond to if if we're going to respond to it from a worldly standpoint. From a worldly standpoint is this, that if somebody bears an arm and kills somebody, you know, their life is to be in danger too, and such as that. But Jesus told us something. In that Sermon on the Mount, if you would continue reading in Matthew chapter 5, and I left off after those first few verses, but go on down to verse 44. Verse 44 of Matthew chapter 5, and he says here, and Jesus is speaking now, he says, But I say to you, love your enemy... Bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Now, you know, that in mind, Jesus is telling His disciples, His followers, that we are to love our enemy, we're to bless those who curse us, we're to do good to those who hate us, We're to pray for those who spitefully use us and persecute us. You know, that is not easy. You know, it's not easy to serve God and to do what Jesus is telling us. But did Jesus say it would be easy? You know, I do know this, that Jesus lived up to what He said. You ever heard somebody, you practice what you preach? You know, in other words, you don't tell somebody else what to do if you're not going to do it yourself. Well, listen to what it says about Jesus. Over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 21 through 23, he says, For to this you were called, because Christ who also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that you should follow his steps who committed no sin, nor deceit was found found in his mouth, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. In other words, Jesus, even when he was there on the cross, did not fight back. You know, he didn't call down the angels, which he could have, to deliver him from the cross. But he committed his life to Christ, or committed his life to God, and we too should do the same thing. You know, Jesus is the very example of love. He's the very example of God's love. In John chapter 3 and verse 16, that familiar verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, 
In other words, Jesus came because of love. He came because God loved us. And he wanted us to be able to have salvation. And he said, Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That is for the righteous, that we can live righteously. And we look forward to everlasting life. He commended his love towards us, and therefore that love that Jesus had, and here's the thing, He said with that, He said, you love your enemies, according to what I read before in Matthew 5 and verse 44. The Christian is to pursue righteousness. The Christian is to live righteous. The Apostle Paul said a Christian is to pursue love in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 1. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 14, He said, let all things you do be done with love. You know, that would sort of what I would say negate that response of arms for arms, guns for guns. You know, whenever evil is portrayed upon mankind, we're to respond with that with love. We're to respond with that not with hate and not in like manner. You know, it's the love of God and the love of Christ that we have that compels us to go beyond what would be required. And you know, the rest of the world, I think sometimes they don't even want to do what's required. But you know, Jesus said this, if one compels you to go one mile, what do we do? What does a Christian do? Well, the world is going to lay that burden down at one mile. The Christian is going to carry it another mile. We're going to go beyond that which is what the world would expect and what the world requires. We're going to follow the commandment of God. Love compels us to be different. Love compels us to be different than the world. You know what? There's response that we can have by that. You know, we can see that in different individuals, but... You know, I have an example here. When I was researching this, I, I found something. Did you know that one of the presidents of the United States was a Christian? I'm not talking about was a Christian in what the world would say a Christian, but I'm talking about was a member of the body of Christ. One that whenever he was baptized, what he said that he was, that he raised to walk in the newness of life, exactly like the Bible says. That man was President Garfield. And you know, he believed that Christianity was something that moves a person. It's something that affects the decisions that we make in life. And here's something that what a lot of people would like to think. You know, you can be a Christian if it doesn't get in your road, you know. Like one fellow was talking about there about elders. The church, the congregation was talking about installing elders in the church and he said, well, you know, he said, I'm not, I'm not opposed to installing elders. I'm not opposed to having elders as long as things keep going the way they've been going. You know, and that's the way a lot of people think about it. That's the way a lot of people think about Christianity. I'm not opposed to being a Christian if I can keep on doing everything I've done before. You know, I'm not opposed to being a Christian if I can keep on doing what I've been doing. President Garfield, here's, a, here's an oral account of what uh, happened to him one time. He said, <clears throat> he said a, a cabinet member, or no, he said, uh, let me go back to here to where it starts at here. He said, oh, here we go, I went too far. He said, Garfield had a cabinet meeting on a Saturday morning one time, an extra session of, on a Saturday morning, and they didn't finish their work. And one of the members of the cabinet said this, Mr. President... I think we should meet tomorrow and talk, uh, talk about these matters. President Garfield replied, If you men want to meet tomorrow, you may do so, but I will not meet with you. I have a more important engagement each first day of the week that I never miss. A cabinet member spoke up. Spoke up. Mr. President, what could be more important than discussing the affairs of the country? Garfield replied, upon the first day of each week, I have an engagement 
with my Lord around the communion table. This table right here. And that is where I will be tomorrow. The cabinet, here's a note, the cabinet didn't meet and the world continued on. And that statement was made by a woman evidently that was there. Her name was Mildred Wilshimer Phillips. President Garfield was a man that believed that Christ should affect his actions. That Christ should affect the way he lives and the way he conducts himself. President Garfield during the Civil War was a colonel in the U.S. Uh, in the Union Army. And he made this point. As being a president, he said this, he said, uh, President Garfield in his early years was a president, or was a preacher. However, politics and war, both essential in civil government, caused him to quit preaching. It was said that because of war, he refused to preach or to serve the Lord's, at the Lord's table. His hands were stained with the blood of his fellow men. Now, you know, I'm not holding that up as a, that we should all do that. First of all, I don't think he should have gone to war to start with. But all I want to say is this. This is one man that had influence in this country that believed that being a Christian should affect their life. Should affect their life in a different way than the rest of the world would. The rest of the world would say, we'll meet on Lord's Day. The rest of the world would say, you can ignore the Lord's Supper. The rest of the world would say, you can carry a gun and shoot somebody if you want to. A Christian is going to respond in a way that is not going to be contradictory to the Scriptures. And here's some questions that trouble me. And I'm just going to put these questions out and let you answer them. Because you know what? I think it's this. It's not only for me to answer, but you also, I think, must answer these questions. Here's the first question. Explain to me how you can kill somebody and keep the commandment, Thou shalt not kill. And when he's talking about thou shalt not kill, he's not talking about a rabbit. He's not talking about killing an animal. He's talking about killing a person. You can find that in Matthew chapter 5, 22, 21 and 22. Explain to me how you can kill someone and fulfill this scripture. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Romans 12. 17 through 21. Explain to me how that you can kill someone and keep the commandment, turn the other cheek. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 39. Explain to me how you can kill your enemy and keep the commandment, love your enemies. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Explain to me how you can kill your enemy and keep the commandment, do good to those who hate you. Luke chapter 6 and verse 27. Explain to me how you can kill and still love one another. John chapter 13 and verse 34. Where does the love stop and the killing begin? Or where does the killing begin and love stops. Where is it? Who determines when to kill and when to love? Is it you? You make that determination or is it God? Who are we serving? Are we serving God or are we serving ourselves? Are we serving our fellow, our fellow man? You know, I think whenever we're talking about bearing arms, and particularly for self-defense, or to the defense of others, I think one of the things that we are 
quick to do, and that is to think about, first of all, we have to protect life. Protect life because that is the most important part. You know, Job speaks about life. He speaks about the number of days, the number of years we have in life. And I realize this is not a fixed number, but in Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10, it was David that wrote these words. He said, The days of our lives are 70 years, and by reason of strength they are 80. Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off where I fly away. You know, we recognize that life is limited, and I guess you could say that, uh, you know, 70 years, 80 years, how much time do we have? But you know what, if you're 70 and, and you're pushing 80 or whatever, you know, I guess you could say that, well, you know, your time is getting close, isn't it? You're not going to live forever. Job describes life, and he describes that the days of our life in Job chapter 8 and verse 9 as that of a shadow. In other words, life is like a shadow. James chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, What is your life? It is even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. You know, we're only on the scene of this world We're only living in a space of time for a short time, regardless of however many minutes it is. And you know, I believe that our life is in, not in our hands, because I ask the question, who can add one day to their life? Who can add one hour to their life? In other words, if if you're at the point of death and you say, you know, I don't want to die yet, Hey, you know, I I want to keep on living. How much can you pay? How much can you pay to extend your life more? What do you have to do to be able to extend your life more? You know, I've never found the answer to that. You know, there was an incident that took place back in December 1971, and Those of us from the San Antonio area, we can uh, relate a little more to this because we know the fellow involved there. But have you ever heard of John Hagee? You know, he's the preacher from Cornerstone Church there in San Antonio. And back in 1971, he was starting out. You know, he hadn't been preaching all that long. But anyway, he was preaching a sermon that day on, on demons. Now, I don't know whether this had anything to do with it or not, but he preached on demons and a fellow came in walked right up to him at a fairly close distance, and I don't know how much it was, but it was fairly close and shot six times at him, trying to kill him. Three bullets went on one side, and three bullets went on the other side. It was John Hagee that later, he was talking about this, he was relating what happened to him on the James and Betty Robinson's television program, Life Today. And he was recounting what happened in October the 5th, 19, or 2015. He made this statement. He said, I believe an angel of God was there pairing the bullets right and left to preserve my life. I would not be alive without the protection of angels. Now, you know, you can believe what you want on that, whether it was an angel or not, but he believed there was an angel that was standing there and was causing those bullets, defective, deflecting those bullets. Because I think this, it would be, you know, I, I'm not a good shot with a pistol for sure. You know, I'm not a good shot with anything, but for sure not with a pistol. But if I was standing directly in front of someone and shot six times, I think I could at least wing him, you know. I think I could at least get one bullet in there. But this man didn't get one in. And so John's conclusion was, it had to be an angel. Well, then later on, Mr. Hagee, he became very active in, the, in defending Israel. And uh, whenever he became active in defending Israel, and his activism in that, he began to receive death threats. Now, John Hagee, you would think, has an angel there for him, you know, that was going to defend him. But now, John Hagee gets bodyguards. 
bodyguards, and they say whenever he's preaching, there's one on this side and one on that side of him. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but the question that comes to my mind, does John no longer believe that angel did it? When did that angel leave? Or was there never an angel there to start with? Or has John's faith as it began to waver and he no longer believes in angels? Well, first of all, brethren, let me say this. Life is not in our hands. And I don't believe I have the ability to extend life any longer. I believe the breath of life that I'm breathing is given to me by God. And this is what is so important, brethren, for us to understand is, is that you and I cannot control how long or how short we live on this earth. You ever hear of somebody that's gone through such a, a tragic accident, you say, wonder how in the world could anyone live through that? How could anyone survive that? And you know, the only conclusion is, is this, I don't have the answer, but God does. God has the answer. You know, it was Job that said this in Job chapter 33 and verse 4. He said, the Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now my conclusion from that verse is this, is that God gave life to Job, and the breath that he's breathing, the air that he's breathing, is because God has given it to him. And the breath that you and I are breathing today is because God has granted that to us. But you know what? Someday, you will not be able to draw one more breath. There will be a time when you will have drawn your last breath. And I don't care how much you desire, I don't care how much you're going to struggle, you're not going to get one more breath. It is not in our hands, brethren. It is not in our hands to say, I am going to preserve my life. It is not in my hands to say that I'm going to live X amount of years because you know what? You may not. We don't know whether or not we will see the clock strike 12. You don't know whether you will ever reach into your pocket and ever pull out your house key and put it in the door one more time. You don't know that you'll ever be able to even start your car one more time. But you know what? You probably have a house key in your pocket now, don't you? Because you're planning on using it again. If you're driving a car, you're planning on getting in that car and starting your car. Those are our plans. But they may not be God's plans. You know, where does this all bring us? We are to live and use the breath we have, but we're not guaranteed of another. Our life is short and we don't know how much time we have left. But I do know this, we don't have the ability and we should not take life. We don't have the ability to preserve our life and if we don't have the ability to take life, then why should we tempt God by trying to do so? You know, I want to close with a scripture here. I started out with a reading that described what I would say what a Christian is, but I want to go back. I want to go back and look at another Christian that I believe, another passage that I believe it is a guide for us, for our living, that's practical for day to day life. Over in Romans, the 12th chapter, 
Romans chapter 12, and I'd like to begin reading at verse 9. He said, Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectioned one toward another with brotherly love, in honor, pre- in honor giving preference to one another, not lacking in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not let your mind be on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him drink. For in, do, for in do, so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome with it by evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, that I believe in just a few verses lines up what a Christian is to be. How we are to react, how we are to serve God. And you know, as we bring this lesson to a close, one of the things that I want to stress above all things, and I think you should know by now, life is short, and I guarantee you don't know how much time you have. And you know, just as it was that that congregation as they came together there in white settlement there, They probably had no thought, the idea someone would come in with a gun and try to kill. And of course, two did lose their lives that were shot, and the gunman also was killed. You know, we may not die by a gunman. We may not die anything but what we would say of old age. We may die of an accident. We may die of a heart attack. There's a whole lot of ways that a person might die, you know. And the question comes is, are we ready? Are we ready? Because the breath of life is not in my control, and I don't believe it's in your control either.